All right, time for a mini lecture. We're going to have two. This one's about fibrous proteins. And at first you might think fiber that you eat. Mm, this is more about fiber that protects you, fiber that grows on you. If you think about it, your hair is a fibrous protein, your fingernails are a fibrous protein. And so these are going to be different than the proteins that we put in a test tube and dissolve up. Those are globular proteins and they have the compact shapes. We've shown you mostly those so far. Uh, but if you look at most of the length of most proteins, the globular form that we have is roughly spherical. It might be a little like bean or something like that. But it's going to be like 130 angstroms by 30 angstroms. Most enzymes that form shapes in water are going to do that. But if you look at the, if you take human serum albumin, uh, in the crystal structure it's 130 angstroms long at this longest dimension you have to realize that there must be another level of structure above the secondary structure. If it was all secondary structure, it would be a fiber. It's not. Therefore, it must be another layer of structure, which we'll call tertiary. Secondary structure of human serum albumin, if it was all alpha, it would be 900 angstroms long. You can do this calculation, by the way, from the dimensions of alpha and beta that we talked about in the last lecture. If it was all beta, it'd be even longer. It'd be only five angstroms wide and 2,000 long. So you just know, they have always known that most proteins that we study in biochemistry fold into compact shapes. But sometimes you want a rope. You know, Samwise Gamgee really needed his rope. Um, that was from the books. I'm not sure it's so much in the movies. But if you know that reference, then congratulations, you remember Lord of the Rings. Sometimes you need a rope. There's this guy who does like airplane safety videos and he goes off into Lord of the Rings and I kind of like wish I could do that with biochemistry, but I don't want to make Lord of the Rings be a prerequisite for this class, so I'll just leave it at that. Watch that guy's videos if you want something good. Here is a fibrous protein. And so you might be able to guess this is microscope of hair. The protein level is much smaller than this, but this is eyelashes. And if you have a big fiber, it's often going to be fibrous on the lower level. So hair grows as a fiber. If you zoom in a little more, you can see some interesting structures, but you can't see the protein structure yet. This is magnified 3,500 3, times. We've got to go a lot further. We've got to get down to the atoms. I think we need to do at least another 10,000 X. So realize that fibrous proteins are really important. It's important to have ropes. It's important to have bricks. And you can make bricks by putting fibers together. And so if you look at this, you have uh, the different kinds of biomolecules. And there are some minerals. We don't really talk about those as much in biochem. We do talk about, we're going to talk about sugars. We're going to talk about chitin and cellulose. Those are fibrous in a certain way. Proteins, we're going to talk about three of them. Collagen, silk, and keratin. And those are the three um, major categories in this lecture. We'll talk about um, keratin first because that is what makes up hair. It's also, we talk about it first because it is made of our first kind of secondary structure, which is alpha helix. Hair is really two alpha helices twisted around each other. So each alpha helix is a helix, right? It's a coil already. If you take two coils and you coil them around each other, you have a coiled coil. So just realize what that term means. A coiled coil is uh, two alpha helices, or it could be any kinds of two coils layered up on each other. You have to get really small to get to the alpha helices because they are arranged in protofilaments, protofibrils, intermediate filaments. For this class, we really care about the protein, the alpha helix. We're working on the very smallest level. The other things are for biology class, okay? So realize we're going to look at that. But coiled coil is a general term and realize that you can have in some other kinds of proteins that are three-stranded coil, coiled coils. In fact, um, collagen is a coil of collagen helices. So I think that you could refer to collagen as a coiled coil, but you want to be specific about what you're talking about. This is the cover of a biochemistry journal, and it's really about ropes being braided, but there's a particular kind of fibrous protein that they were looking at. This is another fibrous protein. Well, I'm not going to say another fibrous protein because 
technically is the same fibrous protein. This is mostly keratin as well. It's just woven together in a different way. It's a goose feather. And so keratin can be woven together in different ways to make lots of different things. Toucan beaks, I believe, are keratin and not collagen. Um, if you zoom in on toucans, you see that there are keratin layers where it's been woven together into layers. Again, this is way above the atomic level, and so we don't talk about it that much in biochem except to say, wouldn't it be cool if we could make it because this material has been designed by evolution and designed by God. I believe those are the same, uh, saying the same thing in different ways, um, that you have this well-designed toucan beak that we can model our keratin fibers. If we can put down keratin fibers in the same way that the toucan does, maybe we can build a cool airplane, okay? So keratin is cross-linked by disulfides. That's the other thing that is uh, biochemically true about it. That means that if you add DTT and BME, you can actually break those disulfides and they will break the fibers apart. They will weaken the overall structure. The other thing that you can add is a hair remover. So a hair remover is something like calcium thioglycolate. The important prefix there is thio. If you look at it, it's got the sulfur. Um, and so it looks a lot like DTT. It looks a lot like BME. Those are both based around thiol groups. So if you add a bunch of thiol groups, they're going to pass their electrons and their protons off to the uh, SS. They're going to reduce it. In fact, if you notice when we're using a, a reducing agent, we're going to do that in the lab in a couple weeks, you might notice it smells like a hair salon because it smells like these kind of uh, agents that result, if you've ever gotten uh, a perm or know someone who has, they're actually using a reducing agent to break apart the fibers, to reduce the disulfides, then you rearrange the fibers into a different thing and you oxidize to make it permanent more per, as permanent as a permanent hairdo is. So the, uh, the other thing that calcium thioglycolate does, by the way, is it's basic. It, um, it turns out the, the calcium is the basic part of it, not the thioglycolate. And that, that will actually swell the hair and loosen the fibers, and that helps to deprotonate the thiols so that they can be protonated by the uh, extra thioglycolate that you have. It's kind of cool because you can talk about the chemistry of how that hair remover works. There's more of this, and I'm always giving you the full title and author of the articles. So if you're interested in learning more, you can go that way. Oh, and the other thing is, you know, if you, uh, Nair is a hair remover. If you get it on cotton, you might worry that it will break down the cotton, but cotton is cellulose. It's a fundamentally different kind of fiber. It's another chapter. And it's one of the reasons why if someone spills nair on their cotton shirt, yeah, it might stain, but it probably shouldn't break it down unless the base is really strong. Well, actually, the base won't break it down either, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. Okay. So the chemistry of hair is big business. Uh, there's a lot of money in recoloring and restructuring hair. And so it involves uh, disulfide bonds and reweaving re re alpha helices. And I always actually, I have a longtime hairdresser that I talk to. Uh, her name's Leah. And we always talk about chemistry because she's talking about hair dyes that she does and, um, and things like that. But, uh, you know, I would recolor my hair, but I would get a, a, a very vivid color and it probably wouldn't be fitting for my age. Okay. So I've shown you lots of pictures of fibrous proteins. Here's another fibrous protein. What do you think it is? If you think it's hair, that's deliberately misleading. I'm deliberately misleading you. It's actually a different protein. It's also fibrous collagen. And this is collagen in a ruptured tendon. If you know someone who's had a ruptured tendon, if you want to go into the field where you treat ruptured tendons, you will be dealing with this kind of biochemistry. And so the tendon should be nice and woven together. This one's broken apart. That's bad news for what the tendon is supposed to do. Skin is also a co collagen containing substance. And so here again, you have layers rather than strands. And if you look at multiple, the, there's lots of layers of skin. Wasn't I just talking to someone about this? 
about why does oil not dissolve skin? Well, it's because you have all these layers of dead skin and it's fibrous and it's strong. It's got a bit of the strength of being interwoven fibers. And there's lots of layers of dead skin if you look at it. Um, it kind of looks like a croissant, but that's kind of gross if you think about dead skin croissants. But um, it's it's got multiple layers. That all works. So collagen also has a hierarchical structure, like, um, but it's a different hierarchy than what you have for keratin. If we're zooming in from the top, and I like this because it shows you the actual scale that you're zooming in. You start at the millimeter scale, you zoom into micrometer scale, you start to see fibers, but only once you get on the nanometer scale do you start to see atoms and the actual proteins. So you have this nanostructure of collagen where you have all these fibers that are sort of overlapping and linked together. And there's the, there, there are sort of short helices that are bound together. If you really zoom in, you see a three-stranded uh, thing on the bottom where you have three strands uh, joined together. And if you really zoom in to the angstrom level, you see that it's got a particular sequence. Gly, you know that one. Pro, you know that one. Hip, you don't know that one. We'll tell you about it. But it's got those three amino acids, for the most part, repeating, repeating thousands, millions, maybe even tens of millions of times in a single collagen fiber. So collagen is not just in skin, it's also an important part of bones. It's very strong, it's in connective tissue, it's in all sorts of things. I just want to show you what it looks like in bones, but you see if you zoom in on bone, you get this tra trabeculi. I think that's how you say it. I don't have to say it because I'm a biochemist. What I have to say is collagen because you have to zoom in a lot on the trabeculi before you get to the collagen fibers. But you see how those at this level, they look pretty much the same as what's in skin and what's in tendons. The cool thing about collagen is because it's got all these pipes structure, it can compress and expand in really cool ways. Now that's above the biochemical level, but if you study bone, you might be able to see how it's a really cool material. And made from amino acids, okay? So collagen is a fibrous protein with a simple tertiary structure because it has three strands that are woven together. Now when you look at that strand, it turns around so it is a helix, but it's not tight enough to be an alpha helix. If you look at it, it's too loose. It's extended. In fact, as we showed you in the last lecture, it is closer to being an extended beta sheet. It is more extended than it is curled. And we can tell that from its five psi angles. When you extend it like this, there's room to put three of them together. And you see that on the left here. When you put three of them together, it's a really strong structure, but it's really tightly packed in the middle. So let's rotate our view. Remember, rotating our view is an important thing to imagine. So imagine rotating your view so you're looking down the fiber now, and that's what you have on the right. And what you have there is you have the repeated sequence being, uh, being colored certain ways. Prolines are colored blue, glycines are colored red, and the middle th thing is colored X, okay? And our previous thing, we showed it as a proline. It can be a proline, but it also can be something else. So Gly X Pro is the repeated uh, coiled coil, the way they're showing it here. Glycine is shown in red, and you can see that all the glycine is in the middle. There's no room for a side chain there. You also need the flexibility of the glycine to be able to adopt the long extended uh, coordination. But that's why every residue, every third residue is glycine and collagen, because it needs to pack tightly like this in the middle. So collagen is also in muscle, which means if you are a carnivore in any way, uh, collagen is in the meat that you would eat were you to be a carnivore. So collagen actually makes a difference between cuts of meat. Steak has very little collagen in it. Stew meat has more collagen in it, and that's why stew meat is tougher than steak meat. Collagen unfolds and it loosens but only above 150 degrees Fahrenheit. That means if you have a collagen-rich cut of meat, you might say, oh, it looks like steak, so why can't I just cut this and put it on the grill? Well, you can put it on the grill, but the grill doesn't get the middle of the steak very hot. It doesn't cook very much at all. It stays below 150. 
So that means all the collagen fibers are still formed in the middle of your, quote, steak, unquote. You try to chew it, you can't. To get rid of that collagen, you need to stew it for a long time. You need to braise it or um, uh, cook it in a, in a li liquid rich, you know, environment. So that it goes above 150 degrees. Then once you do that for a long time, the collagen will slowly unfold. Then you can chew the meat. Collagen is also in the intestine. And so if you've had a natural hot dog, guess what? Those are made from intestines. And so the casing of the hot dog also has a lot of collagen in it. I know that if you're not a meat eater, if you're a vegan, this might remind you of why you're vegan. Okay, so because it's a little bit gross talking about food in such a clinical way, but we're scientists, it's what we do. And so I love Cook's Illustrated. I try to show something from them in most of my classes because they talk about things scientifically. And they ask the question, is it better to have bone-in meat? Does it actually taste better? And they found out that actually, yeah, in some cases, when you have stew, you want to have bone-in meat because the bone contains collagen that will actually cook into the surrounding areas. If you have steak, it's actually not as much of a uh, help to have the bone there because the collagen in the bone won't ever get out of the bone. I like what they say here. There's marrow inside the bone, which is mostly fat. Again, that's a later chapter. But that's going to melt and flow out of the bone, and that's going to be tasty, right? I don't like the word tasty, but I just said it. So there I am, being hypocritical. Anyways, um, the collagen and the connective tissue that is holding the muscle together and surrounding the bone is going to also break down. It's going to make the liquid more like gelatin. In fact, this is where gelatin comes from. Gelatin is collagen that's been sort of just processed a little bit. It's basically collagen that you can melt. So gelatin and collagen will both unfold at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So a couple things don't happen. Look at the bottom. The bone itself will not dissolve because calcium phosphate does not dissolve even in hot water. That's a good chemistry. All of these things are chemically um, said, but they're things that are important to people who eat. So that's the one thing. And if you are vegan, you should be aware that gelatin usually comes from collagen. It means it is an animal product. So that jello cube is actually an animal product. And if you want to avoid those, you should avoid jello. I don't know if there's like a vegan jello. Um, maybe, uh, actually, I do know that there's a kind of carbohydrate that I believe will work. Again, another chapter. Food grade gelatin is used from the parts of the animal that have a lot of collagen but don't have a lot of other things. So that means beef skin and pig hide. It's the, the skin is where you get most of the collagen from. Uh, and uh, what you do is you, they actually unfold it, they hydrolyze it a little bit to make it more soluble. And then you have it come together, but it's not guided when it comes together. So it comes together in this big network, but it becomes more solid, it becomes stronger. Some of it refolds a little bit, but not all of it. Um, so it's definitely, that's what makes the gel in gelatin. If you whisk air into it as it sets, and in a sense it's freezing, it's just the protein is freezing and it has a higher boiling point, uh, then you can get air bubbles whisked in and you can do cool effects like the rainbow jello we have here. You can also put it into a Coke bottle and then remove the Coke bottle from around it. And you can see that you can make jello Coke. So there's a way to make j gummy cola by actually putting the gelatin into your Coke bottle I don't know how it tastes, but it looks really cool, you know? That could be a good prank there, and I've got the recipe for you if you want to do that. But you better believe if you bring me a bottle of Coke, I'm going to be looking at it very closely. Okay, so, uh, and you can use this kind of chemistry in clinical or chemical kind of context in the lab. Uh, for example, if they, they use very tiny molds, and they're basically making very tiny jello areas because you're putting collagen gelatin into that really tiny mold and they're making what's called a micro gel if you just do a uh, if you just do it randomly when you're making jello in your kitchen you're just doing a random coil if you make the mold strong uh, small enough 
you'll actually uh, encourage the protein to refold as a beta sheet. And so it'll be a bunch of beta sheets in that jello, and it'll have different properties. It's going to be very stiff and insoluble. So it's not going to be jello-like. It's going to be a much harder material. And there are scientists who do this. I think that's really cool that just having a tiny mold can make your jello refold as beta sheets rather than disordered random coils. And the one other thing you might have noticed, what was that HYP amino acid? Okay, first of all, it's not one of the 20 you're supposed to know, so don't worry if, you're not, if you don't know it. But because it's commonly found in, in collagen, they gave it uh, the name HYP. It stands for hydroxyproline. You also can occasionally find hydroxylysine in collagen. Remember that there are post-translational modifications that can add a hydroxy onto it. And there's actually been a bit of debate. Okay, we know that that happens. And the question is, chemically, why? Why does it help to make stronger collagen by adding the OH? Originally, people said that it was just a solubility effect, something simple. Scientists always say that, and we're right to say that. Usually, it is a simple thing. It turns out that the simple explanation that you're just increasing the solubility, not true. They actually found out it's a cool chemical effect that has to do with molecular orbitals. So remember those from organic. Molecular orbitals will actually change if you put a hydroxyl on it. And they'll change it to flip the proline ring from its endo to its exo conformation that will flip the backbone, the omega of the backbone, from cis to trans. Which in these cases, in collagen's case, you actually want the omega trans uh, angle. And so that because you want it more extended. It's kind of a cool kind of thing. So it actually, however it works, it does actually matter if you have a, a bunch of the hydroxyls missing from your collagen. The way you put those hydroxyls on is through the power of vitamin C. That gives your enzymes the ability to put the OH on to make your collagen stronger. If you don't have enough, then your collagen is going to be endo, it's going to be uh, cis rather than trans, and it's going to be weak. So you'll have defective collagen that will be scurvy. Do you know the symptoms of scurvy? You can look it up if you want to. But one of the symptoms is bleeding gums. Think about that a little. Collagen is found in these connective tissues like your gums these surface areas like your gums. If you have bleeding gums, your collagen in your gums has weakened and made them bleed more easily. Dentist, take note. So there have also been scientists that have redesigned collagen to say, can I make a different structure that will be even stronger? What they've done is they've replaced all the glycines with azoglycine. You have to do this chemically. You don't do this with the ribosome, but you do this chemically in a test tube. The cool thing about that is if you look at where the glycines are, if you change that C to an N, you put in another hydrogen bond that can hydrogen bond another strand. You basically have a way to tie the collagen even better together. They show that this works in the lab and maybe we can synthesize more of this to make like super strong tendons for tendon replacements. This is a, but it has a basic chemical rationale. More hydrogen bonds between strands these would be tertiary structure hydrogen bonds because they're not secondary structure, they're between two strands. Very cool. So keratin, we, talk, we talked about being uh, cross-linked by disulfides. Collagen is actually also cross-linked, but it's not by mere sulfides. There's not many cysteines in collagen. Instead, you have these cross-links that are stronger. Everything about collagen is stronger, because you want your tendons to be stronger than hair. They need to be stronger ropes than hair is. And it turns out that the collagen crosslinks are covalent bonds between lysine and hydroxylysine. This explains why you have occasional hydroxylysines in collagen, because they help to tie those together. Last but not least, this is our third kind of fibrous protein, and it is also completely different but it's also made of amino acids. It's a protein. This is our Halloween lecture because it's spider webs. If you see this, this kind of view, it looks like somebody's gone to Spirit Halloween and gotten spider webs for their yard. 
this is actually like a caterpillar infestation. That's a lot of protein that you're looking at right there because it is um, all silk protein, spider silk and silkworm silk are fundamentally similar. These don't have any crosslinks at all. In fact, these are also beta strand structures. So I guess we have collagen, which is the collagen triple helix. Then we have beta strands for the silk and we have alpha helices for keratin. We've got all the different types of secondary structure mentioned here. So this is where we see beta structure. And you see there's a lot of sort of beta sandwiches here. Um, but if you look at the side chains, there's a lot of glycines, there's a lot of alanines. That means rather than the, the sheets being cross-linked like they are in the other kinds, the sheets are free to move relative to each other. And in fact, they're so slippery that you can even pull a single strand out. You can like pull on the finger. You know, if you have two things, you can pull on the strand. Oh, let me get my strand. Okay, let's say this is a strand and here's my finger. You can actually pull, I just lost my strand. You can actually pull on one strand and sort of pull it out. That's the stick slip deformation that you see down there. That should make sense to you that you can do that if you can just break a few hydrogen bonds, you're making a few more as you, you do it. You can even, that's how slippery silk is. So, and by the way, that should work better. You see that you have anti-parallel um, beta sheets right there. Um, and you have an anti-parallel sheet that's being shown on the bottom for the stick slip deformation. The cool thing about silk, silk is also being used by material scientists. It's all amino acids and it, you can eat it. If you get a spider web in your mouth, yeah, you might be worried about the spider or the bugs it caught, but you shouldn't be worried about the spider web itself because it is basically glycines and alanines and a few other things. So you can make lab silk out of amino acids and it can act like a web does. In fact, they've used it for an edible coating. Here's the idea. They actually took silk, I believe this is a silkworm silk. They take it and they make a solution of it. And then they dip strawberries in that solution. If you dip it in the solution for one hour, if you, if you dip it just barely at all, you get 23% beta sheets. On You get the coating on it it, when you dip it into the water, you get the silk forms around it. If you just dip it, you get the middle case where you have beta sheets. And you can see, you can't really see the silk on it. It's a edible coating that you can't even see. If you hold it down for, what is it, 12 hours in the water, the silk will form around it and it'll be 58% beta sheets because it'll have more time to organize into the beta structure. Well, it turns out that the 58% beta sheets will actually act as a preservative. It will keep the air out, it will keep good stuff in, and it will, if you take a strawberry with no coating, seven days later, it looks like the picture on the left. If you take a strawberry that's just been dipped, it actually looks a little better, but it still doesn't look that great. If you take the strawberry that's been dipped for 12 hours, it's got more beta sheets, and it's more protected by those beta sheets. You can see that it's actually lasted seven days at room temperature, I believe. That's kind of cool, strawberries that will last that long. And maybe it makes up for the fact that you're eating silk, okay? But there's no problem with actually eating silk. Like I said, it's alanines, glycines. If you put this coating on a banana, um, of course the banana's got the peel, but it will protect the banana from ripening. Day nine, you're used to bananas looking like uh, the picture on the left on day nine, but with the silk coating, they actually, um, they are better colors. They're not as rotten, so a weight doesn't push down as more, and you can open them up and eat the banana, okay? The final thing about this is green fluorescent protein is a protein. Silk is a protein. So can you put the two of them together? People actually have done this, and so they've encoded the, uh, the expression, the DNA to express silk proteins, and the DNA to express the amino acids that come together, and they make fluorescent color. Green fluorescent protein was the first, and we've actually made, once you make green fluorescent protein, you just mutate it a little and make red fluorescent protein and blue fluorescent protein. Very, very cool stuff. But the thing is, it's entirely amino acids, and yet it glows a color. So they've made silk that glows this color. It's got green fluorescent proteins integrated into the silk, 
and they've got pictures of it right here. The silk will even fluoresce when you dissolve it, and you have the different uh, pictures of the colored silk, but this is fluorescent silk. But it's not from fluorescent from a artificial molecule. I don't like those terms. It's, art of, it's uh, fluorescent from amino acids. It came from amino acids, and you can imagine eating it like you can imagine amino acids. So they've actually looked at how silk fibers change, and it's you know you know that silk is stretchy, and actually silk is made up of a bunch of globules, things that are almost globular on the very lowest level. You can see there's a little bit of loose uh, beta strand structure here, but they're not emphasizing this in this. More they're showing you how you can stretch the whole domain. And so. Um, as the protein is spun, it actually gets elongated and sort of spun into fibers. You see more fibers on the right here. The silkworm will actually spin and will elongate the protein and it will make more beta strands as it emerges from the, the silk spinning structure. This spin duct is what they call it here. And we can see what the protein of that is. It's mechanically being deformed, but you're making more beta structure as you do it. Very cool, but very complex. You don't have to know all of that, but I want you to have the idea. You can change a protein structure by mechanically forcing it. Uh, and as long as you, when you make the beta structure, it persists. So that is our summary of fibrous proteins. There is, uh, just notice that keratin involves the helix wheel on the lecture six worksheet. And the helix wheel example that I had at the end of class I went through, you might want to revisit that as well because that's got a lot of good concepts there. All right, and I will make the homework active this afternoon. I know you just can't wait, right?